Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Research. I'm very happy to be able to introduce two talks. The first one by Scott Shanker, who will be talking, us up, talking to us about the data-oriented network architecture. And then the second talk by Nandita Dupka, who will be talking to us about the rate control protocol. Um, we're going to plan on sort of 30 to 45 minutes for the first talk, and then 30 to 45 minutes for the second talk as well. And do you want questions during the talk or hold Questions during the talk are great. Okay, great. Take it away, Scott. Okay, thanks. Okay, so. Um, this, this first talk will be an exercise in the dangers of tenure. And the second talk, uh, the second talk, and indeed is a terrific talk, so I'm going to make sure that I cut off at 45 minutes so you get a chance to see what happens when you're still a graduate student and you, you do real work. This is really, the, I'm going to talk about data-oriented networking architecture. This is with a bunch of people at Berkeley. Um, and the problem we're addressing is simple. That is, the internet was really designed for host-to-host -host communication. I want to log in to some other machine. I want to get a file from some other machine. So you're telling the network, contact this host. Whereas the internet now, as we all know, is used really for data access, which is get me this data. And I don't really care what host it comes from. So there's this mismatch between the design and the usage. And what it means is a bunch of things that are incredibly natural are very hard, unnecessarily hard in the current architecture. Moving data migration, data replication, authentication, and updating, they're all possible. We all have mechanisms, as we see below, you know, things like Akamai, BitTorrent, Coral, Codeine, RSS polling. We can manage to do these things today, but the fact that people keep inventing these new mechanisms can either be seen as a sign that, well, it, it's solved, or that these solutions aren't really sufficient and they're so unnecessarily hard for something that should be one of the basic functions of the network. So, this work is founded around uh, a single question, which is, so given that that's the dominant usage of the network, what would the internet look like if we designed it around this usage, so taking that as sort of a fundamental requirement of the mechanism? This is sort of part of the clean slate mania where you say, you know, let, let's throw everything out, let's start over from scratch. It turns out that this particular design doesn't involve any changes to IP. That, that fell out in the design, not, not, wasn't one of our starting conditions, but everything else changes, naming, whatever. Um, there, so, you know, as part of the clean slate mania, I, I will bring this up at the end, it's not clear that we learn much from this exercise in that I think, you know, I will propose a way you could design a network that would be very friendly to data access, but it's not clear, given where we are now, how we can learn from those lessons, how we can take advantage of them. Uh, now, there are many other design issues besides data access. I'm not going to talk about them here. We've got many other research projects that you know, are considering all these issues. Nothing I'm going to say in this talk sort of contradicts some, at least some approaches to these other issues. So it's not sort of making it impossible to deal with those issues, but I'm not going to talk about it here. And the, the last thing that's important to note is there really are no not new ideas. I mean, every slide you're going to see, you're going to say, oh, well, that was in the triad paper, or that was in the whatever paper. And that's absolutely right. I mean, this is stealing sort of shamelessly from you know, all of the things in the literature, but we've put them together in, in hopefully a new way. So let's start off by saying, you know, what do users care about? When you're going to design a system for data access, what are the things that a user would care about? Well, the first thing they care about is persistence. That is, once they have a name of data, they want to be able to use that name for all time. They want to get back, you know, file not found. They don't want to find out that the data moved somewhere. They want that name to always work. As long as the data is available somewhere, they want that name to work. Okay? So today we do that badly through HTTP redirects or email forwarding or other ways of sort of saying, well, it used to be here, but now it's here, so I'll somehow manage to get you from here to there. The other thing they care about is that if the name works, they then want to be able to get the data. They want to sort of be able to get it both in terms of low latency and also high availability. That if there's any copy of the data around, they want to be able to access it. Um, today we use things like Akamai and BitTorrent in order to help us find copies of the data. And lastly, you care about the authenticity of the data. And here, by authenticity, what I mean is the data came from the source I expected it to come from. That is, if I think this is data from CNN, 
that I want to know that the data really did come from CNN. Whether or not I trust CNN is something I'll talk about much later, but that's not something the architecture cares all about. You get to decide who you trust. All we're trying to do with authentication is that the data really did come from the party you trusted. So today we do that by securing the channel or through a PKI. Okay. So if this is what users care about, then why, what are the barriers to doing this today? So one of the barriers is that naming is sort of both rigid and weak, sort of the worst of both worlds. It's rigid in that it's tied to a host so that moving data becomes very hard because it's you know, a host name, path kind of name, and so it's tied to the host. And the, the name is weak in that it doesn't help at all with authentication. You know, if I go to a site and then I get the data, I cannot tell by looking at the data and the name that those two things go together. And that the data is only named at the application level. In other words, if I do the DNS, then TCP, then HTTP, it's only at the application level where, where I've said what it is I'm after. And so that any kind of data handling, like caching and so forth, has to be application specific. And in particular, there's no low-level support for any cast data discovery. Okay, so that's all got to be up at a high level. So, how we, so we want to fix these two problems. So fix number one is to fix the naming. And so what we're going to do is we're going to steal from self-certifying file system and from HIP, which is to use self-certifying names. And all that means is, so we assume that all data is associated with a principal. That is, that's the person you trust, and it has a public key. And then names are of the form, you take the hash of the public key, and then some label that's unique to that particular piece of data. And then when I go and ask for data, what I'm returned is a four-tuple, which is both the key, the label, the data, and then this whole thing is signed. Now, what happens here is that if you hand me, if I ask for data by name, and then some random stranger hands me back this four-tuple, I can verify that indeed this data came from the name I thought it did, from the principle that I thought it did. So I don't care at all how I got it. I can take it from strangers because on the face of it, I can verify by the name embodies the public key, the four tuple coming back has the public key, so the two are linked together. And so with the signature, I know that, you know, if I'm getting it from CNN, I know that CNN signed this data. So naming now, uh, helps take care of authentication. And this form of a name isn't at all tied to location. So it's not rigid. So it's both stronger naming and it's less rigid. I will describe later how you do resolution. That is, if this doesn't include the location, then how do you find where the data is? That'll sort of be the main part of the mechanism of the talk. It seems like this just trades one problem for a different problem, or arguably it makes an existing problem a little bit more difficult, which is now the names now are no longer human readable. Uh, they're no longer friendly names. So people like you know, short host names or short email names or short whatever. And this means you need some additional step to say, give me the, given the thing that I can describe, get me to the four tuple. So the, the, there are actually sort of two issues. You put it on a business card and make it easy for somebody to type in, right? You need some extra level of interaction. Yes, and, and, and there we explicitly make the decision that that kind of mapping from some sort of short mnemonic to this four tuple is handled outside of the architecture. That's not something we want to standardize. So if AOL wants to sell keywords, they can do that. If BOL wants to sell keywords, they can do that. So my business card says AOL keyword. So that that notion of sort of, we call it canonicalizing a name. So there's sort of a short mnemonic. That should be a market outside. And there you don't have, you know, sort of we don't have ICANN arguing over, you know, sort of who owns this domain because that's sort of a commercial decision outside the architecture. Here, the thing that needs to be standardized, we've explicitly wanted to make it sort of semantic free. So that- We still have the same security problem at the layer higher above, which is verifying that the validity of your keywords, the four tuple is correct and authentic and trusted and so on. Uh, let me get to that in the next slide. Um, so what I claim is that this gives a better separation of concerns. That is, the names take care of persistence and authenticity. Trust, which is the issue you brought up, is handled by external mechanisms. And the point here, trust is only needed when the name is obtained. That is, when I get this flat name, getting it, is, that's when I had to make the decision of do I trust this. Once I make that decision, I don't need to worry about authenticity when the data arrives. That's sort of built into the architecture. 
And so whether or not I trust a name can happen from a wide variety of mechanisms. Like a friend of mine says, this is the CNN flat name, use it. I trust it. There, there's no way that can be part of a standard. And so the things like, you know, do I trust a search engine to hand me back the right name? Or do I trust a reputation system? Those are things that are going to be outside the architecture. And you're absolutely right. They have to be solved. But I, I explicitly think it's a sort of a goal not an unfortunate byproduct, but those are placed outside of the things we all need to agree on, because I think those are going to evolve, and different societies may have different answers to that. Devo different legal systems will definitely have different answers to that. And you're exceedingly unhappy with that. Okay, so, I mean, do, do you think the right answer is DNFs? No, it's a problem that we've wrestled with internally and came to that same conclusion, which is it's not solved yet, right? That you need something more. Um, it's not clear what the right solution is, okay? But so I'm not disagreeing with the architecture. I'm just pointing out that there still exists a problem that still needs to be solved. Right, but, but so it, to some extent, I view it's not just it's not solved, but it is insoluble in that there is never going to be a perfect solution. And given that, you want something that can evolve and not something that we sort of standardize now. And so by having that mapping between human level meaning and some flat name, I don't want to standardize now because I, I don't think we're ever going to have a 100% perfect solution. I think things like reputation systems are always going to be very fallible, but they're better than nothing. And so we're just going to have to sort of learn as we go, but I'd prefer that to be outside of the architecture rather than in. And then, so if you've taken care of persistence and authenticity, and if you've explicitly not taken care of trust, but you've handed it off to somebody else, then the last issue is availability. And that now you can say to the protocols, the network protocols, that's the only thing they need to take care of. That all this other stuff has been done, so now all that your protocols need to worry about is sort of get, making sure the data is available, and that means you can do things like aggressive use of caching. And by aggressive, meaning because I can verify if it's the right data, I don't care who hands it to me. I don't need to trust the cache. If anybody hands it back to me, like a person on the street, that's fine. So you can use very aggressive caching, and you want to go to nearby copies to both lower latency and lower bandwidth on the backbone links. So the second change is to say, once we've got this different naming, how can we use it to do things like finding nearby copies and do better caching? Well, it's to move the names down lower in the architecture. That is, you don't want to just name something up at the application level and have everything down at the lower levels be oblivious to the names. And so, we insert a data handling shim layer right above IP. And so then do the donor layer has two major functions. That is, rather than using DNS style resolution, which is I give you a name, you hand me back where it is. And that means that the resolution mechanism has to make the decision, given who you are, I'll have to find the closest copy to you. We're actually going to route you to the closest copy. So we're going to use a routing algorithm. We understand how to do large scale distributed routing. It's we, you know, the job is to take you to the closest thing. That we know how to do it. That's the right mechanism for it. So we're going to resolve names by routing you to the closest copy. And we're going to provide a general caching infrastructure. So the, the rest of the talk is, how do we do those two things? Okay, because those are designed to support availability. So we're just going to, the rest of the talk is really about how we accomplish these two goals. So we're going to do it through two new network entities. One of them is called data handlers. They're sort of, to some extent, the new version of what DNS um, servers would be. And they operate at this data handling layer of the donor layer, which is just a shim layer right above IP. And they do name-based routing and caching. Okay, so you think of, logically, there's one of these per administrative unit. And you, know, you might think of an administrative unit as an AS, but then you can also think of it as much finer granularity below that. You know, uh, in terms of corporations, I would have a DH in my house and so on and so forth, so you can go down uh, to lower levels. So in addition to these data handlers, you also have authoritative resolvers. That is, if I'm a principal, I have one resolver that knows where there's a copy of all my data. Okay, there, there may be many other copies all over, but there's one place I can go to resolve where my data is. And it, it may be that that thing holds all the data or it may just have pointers to where the data is, but there's one thing that knows where the data is. And then there are two new network primitives. There's find, which is given a data name, I'll go find the closest copy. And 
The find request has not just the data name, but it also has the transport header and the application header. That is, that when it finds the copy, it begins the application level action, whatever that is. That you don't sort of go look it up, find out where it is, and then send another packet. You just start immediately. And then there's register, which is where you say to the network, I have this piece of data, you know, I'm a cop copy, and this has to be authenticated. That is, you have to prove that you've got the private key associated with that data, or at least a certificate from somebody that says you're authorized to serve that data. And you can register either an individual data item or the authoritative resolver basically says, I can resolve everything. So if you route a request to me, I can forward you to, to a copy of the data. So the way it works sort of in an overview is the clients are configured with their local DH. Yeah? The, the register operation, so who are you registering with? Like? So you will register with your D, local DH. My local DH. So and, and that registration command, as I'll show in three slides later, gets forwarded through the network to set up routing state. So in other words, I am telling the network I have this copy and think of the DH as my first hop router at the donor level. So I talk to my local DH as a way of telling the network I have this copy. It will route that registration through the network. So if, if, if I'm a bad guy or my entire organization is bad, you have a way of preventing me from establishing bad routing state through the network? Well, I mean, you, you have to prove that you have the private key associated with that data. So you have to prove that you're authorized to serve that data to the network. You know, the, name, the name of the data has embedded in it the public key. So it can verify whether or not I indeed have the private key associated with that public key. You're saying it has to be trust that the DH can't advertise in the routing system unless the DH can show that the thing is valid. Right. I mean, the, the, hop by hop, this is revalidated. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, I mean, right. I mean, it's not that if I've corrupted the first hop, it then just sort of goes up. No, it's sort of checked hop by hop. Um, and, and actually, sort of by keeping the path, you can then sort of have the higher levels recognize sort of if there was an incorrect command coming in, sort of where things might be coming from. So clients are configured with this local DH. And if I get a find request at a DH, and I've got it in my cache, so these DHs also have a cache, then I just respond as if I'm a cache, I respond to the request. If I don't, then I try and route the find to the closest copy. So that requires that there be some routing table that will tell me what, which DH I should send this to to get it closer. And when you route this, you can decide whether or not you want to get the data on the return path. That is, you can decide, do I want this data in my cache? And if so, you can do that very easily, which is you just put your IP address as the source of the, fetch request, the find request, and then you forward it on. And so then when the response comes back, it'll come back to me. I will have state that, you know, where the find originally came from, I'll put it in my cache and then I'll respond so that I can fill my cache with all these requests. And if the name isn't in the routing table, that individual name, then I route it to the AR. I say that, you know, I don't know where that individual data item is, but I know where the authoritative resolver is and I'll forward it there. Okay. So all of this basically boils down to being able to route. So in other words, if, if I can tell you how to route, then everything works. Okay, so that's really the only missing piece. The routing is, is actually completely standard. So you think of these DHs, you know, this is sort of representing the, uh, you know, a, an idealized version of an AS hierarchy. But these DHs sort of know how to route among themselves. You're, we're just going to implement any cast routing. So, you know, when you register a copy, these registrations flow up. That is, you send them to your parent and your peers. And when I say you send them to your peers, you're going to use the same kind of peering relationships you've got at the BGP level and the same kind of forwarding rules. That is, if you don't want to be a transit AS for data, you don't forward it to some peer. That is, your statement of forwarding it to a peer is the statement of, I'm willing to be a transit AS for this data. So they go up to the parent. That leaves behind routing state. That sort of this one knows that there's a copy of the data here and here. This one knows there's a copy here, and so on and so forth. So the scaling issue is that if you're a DH, the only data you need to have explicit state for is the data that's below you in the hierarchy. So at the edges where we're going to have lots of these things, you're going to have a very tiny amount of state. So it's easy to keep in memory that sort of handling these requests is going to be trivial. If you're up at a tier one AS, you've got a couple of terabytes. 
And handling requests there is iffy, but I, I will talk a little bit about that later. And then you just do any cast routing. That is, that when it issues a find and it gets to a node that doesn't have any state, it just sends it to its parent until it finds some state. And this guy knows that there's a copy down here and it just gets routed there. And so that you'll automatically get routed to the closest copy, according, closest according to the routing metric. Um, okay, so this is totally standard routing behavior. It's just it's done at this donor level. And so you automatically find the closest copy. So basically, this is very simple. That is sort of Dona just says name resolution becomes any cast routing on names, which makes easy replication. That is, if I have 10,000 copies of this, there's no one server that's sort of trying to keep track of where all the copies are, that you just automatically get routed to the closest copy. If data moves, it re-registers someplace new. When people ask for the data, it just gets taken there. Um, and so building a CDN now isn't about the smart figuring out from your IP address where you are and you know, managing all this. It is just setting up a bunch of servers that register data. That's what a CDN would be. Caching is ubiquitous. That is, caching, caches are automatically on the path. Think of it as given, you know, right now I do a DNS resolution, I come back, and then I ask for the data. So the caches have to be on my sort of application data path. Whereas here we're saying we're putting the caches on your name resolution path so that Unless you, so assuming you have no other way of finding out where the data is, those caches are going to be on the path. You're going to have to go through them. So you automatically are asserting caches on the path. And so when you try and build, you know, other applications, like if you try and do BitTorrent on this, the way you implement BitTorrent on this is just a naming convention. That is, you have a top-level name that names all of the chunks of the data. So I go get the top-level name, I get the chunks, and then I go ask for the chunks. And Dona takes care of taking me to the closest copy of all of those chunks. So that there's sort of, you don't have to do any of the routing, which servers you go to, just a question of naming. So there are all sorts of bells and whistles you can add to this. That is, you know, right now I've sort of talked about static content, but what happens if you want to worry about updates? So both, in, you know, invalidating caches or you want RSS. And here it's largely, uh, inverting the normal caching paradigm, which is we're used to caching data and a request comes responding. What happens if we cache requests and when data comes, we forward it on? So it's just turning it around. That's exactly what RSS should be. That is, you know, it's the fact that I've asked for this data, if I put a TTL on my request, so it sits there, memory, when new data shows up at the server, it knows that there's a request for it and it'll forward it on to the previous hop. So you get the automatic RSS behavior you would want, and you sort of build up this RSS tree you know, automatically. So the, you know, the logic is completely simple, um, and you automatically are able to do, sort of do cache invalidation and updating. Load balancing, which, which is sort of a big issue if you're really trying to run a big CDN, um, boils down to um, sort of adjusting the metric on each of the servers. That is, when I describe the routing metric, well, each server is also going to have a sort of a number, and that routing will be sort of be taking shortest path routing. And so if I increase my metric, it's sort of shedding some load. We have not built this yet. We are in the process of actually trying to do it to demonstrate that that's going to be sort of enough to um, deal with this. Now, just that isn't enough, because if I have 10,000 servers over here with you know, a path length of 5 and one server here with a path length of 4.9, I don't want to send all my requests here. And so there's sort of some amount of randomness we're going to have to build in, and we're in the business of, you know, sort of designing that mechanism so that you can actually get sort of load sharing up here rather than this knife edge of it either all goes here or it all goes there. Um, server failure. So what happens if one of the servers goes down and, and Dona hasn't recognized it yet? Like, you know, it's able to answer keep alive, but sort of when it returns data, it just returns garbled data. So what you can do is you can ask Dona not to give you the closest copy, but to give you the kth copy. That is, give me the second closest copy or the third closest copy. So if I get back bad data, I'll just basically be asking for, take me to a different server. And if none of them work, I can just say, take me back to the authoritative resolver. And if the authoritative resolver gives you bad data, then it's the principal's fault, and it's not Dona's fault. Then the, this one, policy. So 
you know, typically when you think about CDNs, there's things like Akamai, which are wide open and everybody ought to be able to access it. But we all know that enterprise networks have sort of a tremendous amount of policy that involves sort of who can access it or do I want to put middle boxes on the path. And to some extent, this sort of first packet that it announces my, you know, this is what I want to do. Here's the data I want to access and here's the protocol I want to access it with is a good place to insert policy. So that's what we're looking at now is sort of how can this data handler then make decisions about either just denying the request or maybe inserting a middle box, like saying, you know, fine, I'll let you do this, but you have to go through a proxy. And so putting the proxy on the path. And that's going to involve dictating something about the data path. And so we're in the business of designing that now. I, I don't really know how it's going to turn out. And lastly, um, sort of ad hoc scenarios. There really are sort of two separate aspects to this. There are the semantics of the register and find. And then there are the routing of them, which is how a register happens to find, a, how a find command finds a registered copy. So in places like ad hoc networks where you don't have any structure, you don't have a hierarchy to route, you might use a completely different dissemination algorithm. Like you might, you might broadcast finds and not do anything with registers or vice versa or some other random thing. And so you might have a very context specific decision about how you want to do the dissemination of these things based on where you are. Um, and I'm going to end with sort of two of, of the sort of many open questions. Most of the open questions are, you know, sort of various sort of details like I went through, but two of the, the ones that I sort of get down to whether or not this was a total waste of time or not was, you know, does this scale? And sort of every part of this it's trivial to scale except when you get to the sort of the tier one ASs that are sitting there. They've got terabytes of data. They've got to handle a high bandwidth rate of requests. Now, obviously, you're going to put these boxes on the edges of peering links. So that you know, you're not putting them on your backbone links. You're going to put them on your access links. And so low speed access links are no problem. But so the, the one gig or 2.5 gig peering links, that's where you really start to push things. And I think it really is going to boil down to what are the cache hit rates. Both that sort of, given that we have all these caches along the path, how many, you know, starting with some request stream down here, how many of them are going to be left by the time you get to tier one? And then second, you're going to have a working set in memory. Now, sort of handling the number of requests in terms of your CPU is trivial. It's disk seeks. So you're going to have some working set of data names that are going to be in memory, and how many times you're going to hit that versus going to disk. And you know, it's just very hard for us to do estimates. If you get anything over sort of 80% hit rate here, we think we're fine. But you know, in this new world where data is named this way, it, it's not clear that we're going to get the same level of hit rates that people do now. Well, yeah. It's an obvious adversarial attack where I want to bring down the internet, and I can just fabricate requests for things that probably don't exist, right? So, so I, I didn't talk about this. Uh, because it's sort of not part of the design, but it's sort of part of our going in assumption that, um, well, the, the two parts to your question. One is we assume that, you know, you have a contract with your internet service provider that gives you access to a DH. And so there's going to be some resource limitation on how many requests I'm going to be able to send. And then clearly if I'm sending sort of, you know, full out, that, that should be stopped at the first top and, and you know, so on and so forth. There's sort of a certain li limit. But I, I, I think that partially what you may have been asking is, I can at make requests that I know will go to disk. And so one of the ways to respond to that is, I know where the authoritative resolver is. And so if I'm starting to get overloaded, what I do is I don't look for the individual data name. I just say, I'm going to send it to the authoritative resolver. Then the number of things you have are just the principal keys, not the data names. And that, I think, is probably going to be much more likely to fit in memory. You just shed load as, as fast as you can. And that way there's, um, so then the question is if somebody starts sending in requests for principles that don't exist. And that I don't know what we're going to do. I mean, that, that would be the sort of query of death. I mean, even beyond sort of the adversarial model, where I'm, I'm trying to break it, yeah. if I'm doing a web crawler, you know, you know Google and MSN search are going to have very bad locality. I mean, they're just, they have to be tier ones so they can sort of be bashing their own infrastructure? Or? Well, so I, I guess the question is, that, so you're only going to go to a tier one if the data path, and I, I, I didn't say this, but the sort of the, the DH path between 
a resolution will be exactly the AS path of the data um, the, the data would have traversed. And so it, um, if, if all of the copies of the data that you're asking for are sort of a tier one away from me, then we're in trouble. And so if, if people are you know, sort of a, an individual web crawler that's sort of well behaved is not a problem. If everybody decides to sort of crawl the web full out, then, then I think we're in deep trouble. And so that's where the sort of, um, you know, if there are any kind of resource controls of what the, the edges sort of allow as sort of reasonable behavior, are we going to be in trouble in tier ones? And that, that you know, we just sort of don't know where that, that trade-off is going to be. And then the last point is, is sort of, if you, and this is, you know, a hypothetical, if you think that this design might be the right thing to do in this sort of clean slate hypothetical future, is there anything we can do today or, you know, sort of in the near future that embodies part of this? And part of the problem is that, you know, the good part is we don't change routers. So we don't have to change anything about the data path. The bad part is we change data names, which is sort of even worse, because that changes what humans use, which, you know, are, is even more of a problem than changing what routers do. And that, I don't know how to get started. Meaning, you, certainly you can have sort of two parallel naming structures and resolution structures, which is I hand a name to, um, oh, I unplugged this. So I, I hand a name to my, uh, you know, sort of my, my host hands a name down, and it splits off two resolution requests, one to DNS, one to this infrastructure, and whoever answers first wins. And sort of if Donut doesn't have it at all, then you know, nothing bad has happened. But that would require, you know, major software vendors to actually sort of put this into, you know, into their stack that, that you actually have these two separate tracks of resolution and that users actually register their data with Donut. And so that looks very unlikely. So, so our path to doing this is, is actually to basically just we're going to set up a BitTorrent tracker. That is, what we're going to do is set up a tracker that uses this technology. We're going to set up, you know, a set of DHs, and we're going to register copies of the data. And the sort of, you know, when people want data, they're going to use our mechanism is going to be what finds them a close copy of the data. And so that's sort of the only way we see of sort of getting this into usage without anybody actually knowing that they're using it. That's it. Yeah. Do you think this architecture can like multimedia streaming where sort of on the one hand you're accessing data, but on the other hand there is a lot of application specific uh, mechanisms like adaptation and so on that may be. Oh, so, so absolutely, because remember to some, I mean I, I should have made this clear, that this first packet gets taken to the location of the data and then it responds directly to the source or to caches if it wants to talk to caches. So if it is streaming media, it would be labeled don't cache. And then these two endpoints would talk directly, and, and you would have all the application-specific processing. The well, well, what you would do is you would automatically be taken to the closest source of that video. So if I had 10,000 sources of the video, I get, but, but caching you know, doesn't happen. The slight issue would be in the signing the data now. It, it is harder for me to look at a stream and know that yes indeed this came from I, I know that the first packet might come from the source but if somebody else starts you know being an imposter later that that sort of a signature over the data per packet on a media stream is probably not a realistic way of, of validating the data so that so you both lose the caching and you lose the sort of self-certifying of the data itself yeah closest copy. You know, if you don't have caches, then the assumption that it gets to the closest one seems to be predicated on the data source and the authoritative the AR actually being nearby. Whereas if your data source is mobile but still has an association with some AR, there's no guarantee of locality there. And so if you have a bunch of ones scattered around, you need some additional locality mechanism to find the ones no, no, So, so uh, um, that if there are multiple copies, that they all register independently. And when, when I route for the data, I will find the closest one. Um, it is only if I don't find any of them that I actually am taken to the AR that the AR will take me to a copy. Maybe I misunderstood. Let's say you have 
four guys, each of them have the same data, but it's all somehow real time such that it can't be cached. Okay. okay I mean, four video cameras at the same event, something like that. Um, or, you know, four telescopes watching a cosmic event or whatever it is. Okay, but, but um, I mean, are, are, are these identical copies or yeah. the, the, oh, okay. The things for which the four tuple is the same, but which the four uh, locations uh, vary in network location in terms of moving around the network by IP address. But they're all associated with the same principle. They're all associated with the same AR in this example. Right? Um, and so here, trying to find the closest one, I don't think this would solve it by itself, but need something else to find the closest one. So, so there the are two aspects to your question. Let me separate them. Let's assume they're not moving. Then you have these four sources. Right. I will get routed to the closest one. Do, do we agree on that? Mm, no. Because, I mean, I, the, the registration command goes up, and the find command will intercept it, and I'll be taken to the close. I mean, maybe I misunderstood. I thought that what you meant is your registration command uh, would go from the client that's hosting the data to that client's DH or AR, which is the same box as I understand it here, right? No, no. It, it would that there is an AR that knows where all my data is, right. and, and let's let's assume that that is the principal's DH. That, that's yes, a fair that, assumption. That, that was my okay. assumption. But, I don't know if that was valid. So, okay. so here, and th this is my my DH slash AR. Right. But now there's copy one, copy two. They all register with whatever DH they happen to be located in. So this one may be in Asia, this one may be in Europe, and this may, one may be in the US. Okay. So any request you know, coming from this continent will be routed there. So they don't register with their home DH. Oh, yeah, you're, absolutely. Right. They register with wherever they are. Ah, right, right. So precisely, if they registered here, we have the Akamai problem. Right. Right. So yeah, so, so you register with where you are, and you get routed there. Okay. Um, the, the, the problem that you, the, the second part was, if they're moving, yeah. then, you know, sort of it's how, it yeah, 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 exactly. And, and the other thing would be, if for some reason this AR, the copy it knew about was like way over here, then you may be in trouble. The, the sort of routing to the AR is, uh, there was a question over here that may have. I just had a question. So most of the time you're trying to exploit localities. If you have the data somewhere close by, pick it up from there, yeah. right? So, something that changes rapidly, let's say news web page or something like that, that may be substantial overhead because first, as soon as you have, you're looking for that data, you're going to try to find everybody around you, see if they have an up-to-date copy or not, and then eventually you may just end up fetching it from the original data source. Is that right? Or? Well, so so let, let's take this. So let's say we have uh, a piece of data that has a short TTL, meaning that this sort of is being updated every minute. So the, the data source would put a TTL of one minute that says if you get it within one minute, it's still valid. Then what would happen is I would do a request. And so uh, let, let's assume that there, there's only one feed, meaning that there's, there's one data source. I would make a request. And at each cache, it would check to see whether the, the copy in the cache you know, was within its TTL or not. And if not, I would go back. But subsequent requests within that TTL would you know, and you can do HTTP kinds of things where if I find a copy in the cache, what I first do is I just ask the server, is this still the, the valid copy? You know, rather than going and dragging it over. Um, but but it, it's, you know, stand, I mean, that, in, that extent, you know, we're stealing everything from HTTP the way it does now. Okay, maybe one more question before we go on to the next talk. There was a question. Yeah, yeah, I have a question. Uh, when you talk about the, uh, using this structure to support uh, multimedia streaming, I think uh, this is, uh, you mentioned there's no, won't be any caching? Well, if, if I don't know how to build uh, a cache. I mean, if you have a, a stream from here, I, I don't, I mean, if a cache decides that it wants, you know, let's say it's a gigabyte file. If the cache decides that A, it, it understands that application level protocol, and B, it's willing to stuff a gigabyte on its disk, it can cache it. I mean, there's nothing preventing it, but it's just sort of caching that is a much higher onus than normal caching. There's already like a media streaming over And uh, whatever caching they use can be just used here directly. Right? Like the, the tool, like a, uh, like a called PP Live or those media streaming, real-time media streaming over P2P networks. I think they do caching, they do kind of the, like the file sharing. I mean, so, so if, caching structure if your DH wants to do caching, that's great. It's just that it's sort of a much bigger burden than some of these boxes may be willing to, to take on. Um, but, you know, so, so it wasn't a technical reason that it couldn't do it, but it's just sort of, uh, 
you're not going to be able to cash a lot of full-length movies uh, yeah. without getting in trouble. Not, not like that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, let's thank Scott for Thank you. And next up is Nandita, who will be talking about the rate control protocol, which is a new way of thinking about congestion control. Okay. So, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Nandita, and uh, I'm a graduate student at Stanford. Uh, I've been working on the new congestion control and the rate control protocol, and that's what I'll be talking about. I'll be talking about for the next half hour or so. And I'm happy to take questions anytime during the talk. OK, so we all know that TCP is not really the, the best protocol that we can have, congestion control protocol we can have in a high bandwidth delay network. It's been demonstrated experimentally and shown mathematically that TCP reaches, uh, becomes very inefficient in a high bandwidth delay product network. So here are uh, let's quick. Here is a quick recap of some of the problems with uh, TCP. Well, first of all, the slow additive increase of TCP means flows take an extremely long time to acquire any spare capacity in the network. As a very simple example, consider a flow with a window size of about 80,000 packets, which is needed in order for it to have a sustained rate of 7.2 gigabits per second, with a round trip time of 100 milliseconds. It takes approximately 40,000 round trip times, uh, or approximately 70 minutes, in order to recover from a single packet drop. Clearly, that's unacceptable in high, uh, high speed networks. Second, the TCP flows need extremely and unrealistically low loss probabilities in order to be able to sustain high bandwidth or a continued high bandwidth. This makes it extremely difficult for a flow to have a high sustainable, lar a large sustainable window in uh, high speed networks. And this is a consequence, once again, of TCP's slow additive increase and the drastic multiplicative decrease, and the fact that it cannot distinguish between losses due to congestion and uncorrectable errors. Third, it gets confused by lossy links, treats them as congested networks, and underutilizes them. Fourth, it shares bandwidth inversely proportional to the round trip times. As a result, long RTT flows have a hard time obtaining their fair share of the bandwidth. They, once they are in the AIMD mode, they increase their windows much more slowly and lose out to the short RTT flows. Now, while all these are consequences of TCP's AIMD, its slow start is inefficient as well because even when a flow is capable of finishing within a few in order of one round trip times, today's t TCP slow start makes it last multiple round trip times just to find its fair share rate. And most often, flows finish before they reach their fair share rate. And finally, it fills up any amount of buffering available at the bottleneck links uh, just to find, because it uses loss as the only indication of, um, as a, as the only indication of congestion. As a result, extra buffers mean extra delay, adding to the duration of flows. Now, there have been research efforts to alleviate a subset of these problems with TCP. But by far, one of the most radical solutions in the literature has been the Explicit Control Protocol, or XCP. Now, the reason that I'm bringing up about XCP is this is by far the most, uh, the, the freshest look at congestion control so far. And um, it has a good reputation in the congestion control literature. It's proposed by Katabi and others and is a part of the New Arc project. So the way XCP works is it involves the routers in congestion control. The routers explicitly notify the receivers the state of congestion in the network and how to react to it. And the senders adjust their window sizes based on this precise feedback information that they receive. So all the new flows in XCP start with a very small window size. And the picture that you should have of XCP is that in every round trip time, flows receive a window increment or a decrement over the current window size. And so at any point in time, different flows could have different uh, window sizes and different round trip times and therefore different rates. And they're continuously trying to converge towards the same fair share rate by slowly reducing the window sizes of flows with 
uh, whose rates are above the fair share and increasing the window sizes of flows whose rates are below the fair share. And this convergence could take many, many round trip times. And all the while, the fair share is continuously changing because new flows arrive and old flows finish. And all this is done while doing extremely detailed per packet computation at the routers. So in the rest, um, okay. so the main benefit of XCP over TCP, the, what you should take away is that it solves all the problems with TCP that I've talked about before, so long as flows are long enough. So it solves all the problems when there is a fixed, an, a static environment of long-lived flows literally having an infinite amount of data to send. And in such a scenario, it actually results in a very high 100% link utilization. Uh, it results in a fair share of the link bandwidth and very small queue occupancy with a near zero packet loss. But yet we believe that XCP doesn't really make much sense because of the following reason. Well, first of all, it achieves the ideal goal of processor sharing in a static environment of long-lived flows. But actually, when there are a mix of flows, it deviates far from what it's been trying to achieve, which is trying to emulate processor sharing. In fact, it becomes unfair and inefficient and far worse than even TCP. So when there are flows of different sizes arriving randomly, sharing a bottleneck link, it in fact makes the flows last two orders of magnitude higher than necessary, worse off, many times worse off than TCP, as we'll see. And all this is done while doing very detailed per packet computation at the routers. So in the rest of the talk, what I'm going to show you is how we can achieve not only what XCP does with the long-lived flows, but even more when there are a mix of flows, all while doing very little work at the routers. Let's have a look at an example. In this example, this example actually compares the performance, the flow completion time of two protocols, XCP and TCP, with the ideal that can be achieved. But before we get on to the example, let me tell you something about the metric that we're using out here. Now, if you look at the most of the literature in congestion control, it's very likely that you will find the metrics that are being used are link utilization or a long-term, uh, which is a very network-centric metric, or a long-term property such as convergence to fairness. Now, these metrics don't make sense for a couple of reasons. First of all, they're either very network-centric, such as link utilization that a user doesn't really care about, or it's a long-term property such as convergence to fairness, which only makes sense if a flow actually lasts that long to see this property. So instead, we decided to use the metric of flow completion time, or how quickly does a flow finish, from starting from when the sender sends the send packet to when the receiver receives the last packet of the flow. Clearly, this is a more direct indication of how the user experiences the network. So coming back to these plots, what you're seeing on the left-hand side is a plot of the average flow completion time versus a subset of the flow sizes observed in the simulation. Flows arrive randomly, and they have a heavy-tailed flow size distribution out here. The top plot out here is the flow completion times under XCP. This plot out here is the flow completion times under TCP. As you can see, most of them finish up in the slow start. A few of them experience losses and take longer to finish. And this is what flows would have finished if they were ideally processor shared. And the one on the right-hand side shows the number of active flows over the simulation over time. As a consequence of TCP and XCP making the flows last much longer than processor sharing, there are consequently a larger number of flows built up over time. So in the remaining part of the talk, I'm going to show you how we can achieve flow completion times close to this ideal, close to as if the flows were ideally processor shared, while doing extremely little work at the routers. What are you, I mean, what is it, is it in simulation? Yes, this is in simulation. The setup is, uh, it's a high bandwidth delay product, so the link capacity is 2.4 gigabits per second, and the round trip time is 100 milliseconds. In this particular case, is for a single bottleneck case, but it really doesn't make much of a difference. Okay, so. Okay. 
So what are the qualities that we would like if we are to design a congestion control mechanism? Well, first of all, we would like to ideally emulate processor sharing. That we would like to be as we we want to be as close to uh, processor sharing as if the flows were ideally processor shared. Why? Processor sharing is actually a very nice, uh, very nice property to have. Well, first of all, because its performance is invariant of the flow size distribution, at least for a single link case. Second, it actually results in flows finishing very quickly. In fact, quite close to the best that can be achieved. And third, even if there are only long flows, suppose there are no mix of flows, then it actually results in 100% link utilization and the link bandwidth being very fairly utilized, uh, utilized in a fair manner. The second property that we would want is we, want, we would want the network to be stable, irrespective of, in the sense that it converges to some equilibrium operating behavior if there is one, irrespective of the network conditions such as topologies or round trip times or the link capacities or the traffic conditions such as the mix of flows, long flows, short flows, and so on. And finally, we would ideally want to achieve these properties without any per flow state or uh, per flow queuing or any complex per packet computations at the routers. So RCP is, RCP stands for rate control protocol. The approach in RCP is slightly different from that of TCP or XCP. Instead of giving an incremental window change in every round trip time, the question we are asking is, is there an explicit rate the router can hand out to the flows so as to emulate processor sharing? If we are to offer one rate to all the flows, what would that rate be? Now, if the router really knew the exact number of flows at every instant of time, and all the flows were bottlenecked at that particular router, then this question is really very simple. The router should just give C over N to all the flows and be done. And if there was no feedback delay between, then this would reach uh, the, the sources instantaneously, and this would solve the problem. But unfortunately, it's hard to keep track of the exact value of N at the routers. And even if it could keep track of N, by the time this information reaches the source, there is a feedback delay, so N would have changed anyways. And further, different flows have different amounts of data to send, and they are bottlenecked at different points. So N doesn't really make much sense. Uh, estimating the exact value of N doesn't make sense, which is why we propose that RCP be an adaptive algorithm that updates the rate that it offers to the flows without keeping track of N, without any knowledge of N, in the presence of feedback delay with, without keeping any information on the number of flows. So it is a particular heuristic which is designed to approximate processor sharing in the presence of, in the absence of this information and in the presence of feedback delay. It has three main characteristics that actually make it very appealing. One of them, first is the rate is picked by the routers just based upon the aggregate incoming traffic and the queue size information. Second, the router offers a single rate to all the flows passing through it. And finally, it doesn't need any state or any um, per flow queuing and very minimal per packet computations. So the basic mechanism is, as you would have imagined by now, that every router maintains a single rate R that it updates periodically. Say for now, once every average round trip time of the flows passing through this, uh, passing through that uh, link. Every source before starting sends a SYN packet in which, it, um, in which it sets the rate that it would like to transmit at, and it could set it arbitrarily high. And as this SYN passes through the network, if the rate at the router is uh, lower than what is there in the SYN packet, the re it overwrites it. So by the time it reaches the receiver, it has the lowest rate corresponding to the most congested link along the path. And this is echoed back to the receiver, and to the sender, and the sender starts transmitting at that rate. And thereafter, every data packet is, the, this rate is piggybacked in every data and the ACK packets. So the sender keeps getting an updated rate from the network, even if the flow lasts longer than a round trip time. Apart from this, every packet also carries uh, the sender's estimate of its round trip time. 
and the routers use that to maintain to uh, to maintain their average of the round trip time of the flows passing through a particular interface. So let's look at the exact algorithm that the routers use in order to update this rate R. Now in order to emulate processor sharing, intuitively you just need to do three things. Well, first of all, you need to offer a single rate to all the flows. Second, you need to fill up the outgoing link with traffic. And third, you need to keep the queue occupancy small. And this is the intuition base that this, uh, that which forms the basis for this equation out here. So R is the rate that is updated by the router at time t. D0 is the average round trip time that is maintained by the router, round trip time of the flows passing through it. So R of t minus D0 is the rate that it offered in the previous control interval. C is the link capacity. Y is the aggregate incoming traffic. Q is the, the current Q occupancy. Alpha and beta are parameters chosen for stability and for performance. And n hat of t is the router's estimate of the number of flows. We'll, we'll see how it, uh, how it maintains that. So all this equation is trying to do is if there is spare capacity available, that is c minus y of t is greater than 0, increase the rate evenly amongst all the flows. On the other hand, if the link is oversubscribed, that is c minus y of t is less than 0, or there is a q built up, then decrease the rate of all the flows evenly. So you can think of the numerator as the aggregate amount of traffic change that you want to bring about in the next control interval. And by dividing that by your estimate of the number of flows, you, uh, you arrive at the per flow rate. Now the router does not know the exact number of flows, so we estimate it as C divided by the rate of the previous round trip time. Now I'll come to you shortly as to why this is a good estimate and when it can be bad, and if it's bad, why we don't need a good estimate. And alpha and beta, as I said, are parameters for stability and performance. There's one more change to this basic equation, which is we would like to update the rate more often than a round trip time. Because after all, if a queue is building up, why wait for an entire round trip time before reducing the rate? You might as well reduce the rate so that the newly arriving flows can uh, get a smaller rate. So as a result, we update the rate more often, say once every t seconds, where t is typically the order of 10 milliseconds. So it, it updates at the rate at the minimum of a user-defined parameter t and the average round trip time. Since we update it more often, we correspondingly bring about a smaller change for every aggregate uh, update. So you update it more often, but correspondingly do a smaller change each time. And that's why we scale this aggregate change by t divided by d0. And there are other small changes, like this gamma, for example, controls the, uh, link, the target link utilization. We might not want to operate the link at 100% target utilization, but instead would like to leave some headroom for any surge in traffic to drain away. So this is the rate update equation that is used by the routers to offer um, the rate to the flows. Let's try to understand. Yes? Uh, do those equations take into account that not all traffic may be TCP? So you had some UDP streaming stuff. Yeah, so, on. so essentially. Capacity divided by the number of flows, does N take into account that there may be things that, are, that would be consuming capacity that aren't a TCP flow? Yes, so, essentially, so that would be. Um, what what we're, what it would reduce to if uh, if you do this algorithm update uh, uh, adaptively would be it would do c minus take away the traffic that is not responding to the RCP congestion control so it would do c minus divi that traffic divided by that's the already n. In the equation, so you're saying that's what the equations would then become in order to the, that. That's what the equations would become. How yeah. would you know who's not responding without keeping code Uh. You don't need to keep per flow state. Well, you're saying that you need to subtract out the capacity consumed by flows that are not responding, right? Your well, all I'm saying is that suppose I have a flow, suppose I have a UDP flow that is just blasting at whatever rate, so, uh, and it's, uh, so essentially your C in this case, the R, just becomes C minus right, the unresponsive flows. Q would continually get built up until 
you get no, no, but the capacity needs to be set to a value no, that it takes out to. No, it doesn't. Just it takes care because this you have the C minus Y of T term, so it, it's just taken care of that. We can take it offline. Okay, actually, I have. Uh, I'm going to come to that, so we can also talk about. So let's. Let's understand some things about the algorithm. But first of all, how good is the estimate C divided by R? Now, when there are only long-lived flows in the network, then C over R is actually a very good estimate of the number uh, of the exact number of n. For example, here there are 20 long flows which start at time zero, and 20 more flows start at time 40. And in each case, C over R converges. Well, in this case, what's plotted is R over C converges to one over n, which is 0.05 here and point. 025 out here, and the 20 flows depart in this case, uh, finish at time 100. Now, even if flows are not long, but suppose the mean flow length is comparable to the bandwidth delay product, that is, the mean flow size is, uh, is about equal or greater than C times RTT, then even then, C over R is a good estimate of the number of flows as it's plotted out here the number of active flows versus time when the mean flow size is comparable to the bandwidth delay product is just a noisy estimate because flows are arriving quickly and departing. So the real question is, what happens when the mean flow size is actually very small compared to the bandwidth delay product? Because here, most of the flows do not have at least a round trip time worth of data to send. And in this case, C over R underestimates the number of flows. But underestimating the number of flows and thereby giving a higher rate to every flow is actually the right thing to do because if most flows do not have at least a round trip time worth of data to send, then giving exactly C over N to every flow is not going to fill up the bottleneck link uh, capacity. RCP doesn't change uh, the way in which loss the, the loss is detected. That's pretty much that's done the way TCP does it currently. And the, its parameters, alpha and beta, can be chosen for in order to make RCP stable for a very broad range of network and traffic conditions. I'll come to, I'll come to how we choose its parameters, alpha and beta. Let's have a look at some performance results of RCP. So we tested the performance. What I'm going to show you are simulation results. We tested the performance of RCP on a very wide traffic characteristics, such as when under different flow size distributions, under different flow arrival patterns, under different network loads, and so on, and under different network conditions, such as uh, different topologies, when flows with very heterogeneous round trip times share um, shared links, under multiple bottleneck links, conge reverse congested links, and so on. And in every case, the performance metric that we were interested in is the average flow completion time where the flow completion time is the time interval between when the sender sends the SYN packet to when the receiver receives the last packet of the flow. An average flow completion time is just the mean over a subset of the flow sizes observed in the simulation. And in every case, we were interested in comparing it to TCP, XCP, and that of the ideal processor sharing, which can be just computed by this expression out here, where it takes uh, at least one RTT for the SYN-SYNAC setup, 0.5 RTT at least for the data exchange, plus the mean flow length divided by the link capacity times one minus rho, where rho is the offered load. So this is what we compare it to uh, in every case. And in each case, you will find that RCP sets out the goals that we've set out before, achieves the goals that we've set out before. Well, this is an example where the setup is a high bandwidth delay environment where the link capacity is 2.4 gigabits per second. The round trip time is 80 milliseconds. What you're seeing out here is the, the y-axis is the flow completion time versus a subset of the flow sizes observed in the simulation. This is just the range from 0 to 2,000 packets, and this is the larger flow sizes. There are three distinct lines out here. What you find out here is the topmost line is XCP, then is TCP, the green line is TCP, and this is the blue line is RCP. And you also find um, what, what's also plotted is the processor sharing delay, 
and the delay that flows would have taken if they finished completely in slow start. So in this particular case, RCP, um, TCP is about five times higher and XCP is about 30 times higher, and RCP does very close to processor sharing. What's also shown out here in the bottom plot is the maximum flow completion time for any uh, given flow size. So it's not just that um, the average is close to processor sharing, but actually the maximum flow completion time for any flow under RCP is also close to processor sharing. Whereas in case of TCP, the, the variance is pretty high. The maximum is often 10 times above the mean. Notice that although XCP was primarily designed for long-lived flows, but when there are a mix of flows, it actually does badly for all of them, for short and for the long-lived. Now, it's, it would be unfair to say that actually XCP always performs worse off than TCP because that isn't so. I mean, if you keep increasing the mean, uh, the mean flow size relative to the bandwidth delay product, then XCP begins to perform better than TCP uh, because this is precisely the regime that it was designed to perform well, where there are a few, multiplex, a few high bandwidth flows multiplexed in a network. And that's the region where TCP begins to perform much worse off, as shown in this example out here, where the, ban the mean bandwidth delay product is comparable to um, the bandwidth delay product of the network. In case of RCP, it makes no difference because th there are no assumptions on the mean flow size. So if you actually look at what is it about these protocols that give such vastly different characteristics, then here's what you will find. So what's shown out here is a plot of the sequence number evolution versus time for these different, pro for randomly sampled flows for these three protocols. First notice that in case of TCP, most of the flows, it's very likely that you will find most of the flows just finish up in slow start. Some of them experience losses and take longer to finish. And if they go, get into the AIMD phase, they are extremely slow in catching up with spare capacity and take many times longer to complete. Whereas in case of RCP, they receive the best, the, they receive the best equilibrium rate that the router thinks should be the equilibrium rate, and they finish up quickly. XCP actually takes many times longer than TCP in most of the cases, in, in almost all the cases that we've tried out. So flows start extremely slowly, and they receive, they ramp up very slowly over time. In general, it makes the flows last many round trip times just to avoid oversubscription and to keep the queue occupancies low. Well, our RCP, on the other hand, um, ramps up fast at the expense of a temporary bandwidth oversubscription. So this is just another, the last of the examples where I'm going to show you, where the, the results are not, um, are not dependent upon the flow size distribution. So far, I've showed you with heavy tail flow sizes. And this is just the case with exponentially distributed flow sizes. So its processor sharing emulation is independent of what mix of flows, flow sizes you offer to RCP. So the other property that I had mentioned where um, that is desirable of a congestion control protocol is that it is stable irrespective of the network and traffic conditions. Stable in the sense that if there is an equilibrium operating point, we want the protocol to converge to that equilibrium point and remain there. And even if perturbed, it should come back to the equilibrium point. Now, in case of RCP, it turns out that its parameters alpha and beta can be chosen to make it stable independent of the network and the traffic conditions. So for example, the way to interpret this graph is that so long as you choose alpha and beta onto the left of this red dotted line, the system is stable independent of the link capacities, the round trip time, and the number of flows. So the two regions which are plotted out here, one is um, the, blue, the blue shaded region just shows the, the stable region of a linearized system. But it turns out that actually if you take the nonlinearity of the system into consideration and do a stability analysis, 
the nonlinear stable region turns out to be larger and encapsulates the linear stable region, which is shown on by the onto the left hand side of the red dotted line. So what this says is we don't need to expend too much effort in choosing the parameters alpha and beta. And this is very important because we know the number of papers that have been written to tune the parameters of red and TCP. So there are some other problems that we've thought about uh, uh, given thought under RCP, which I won't have time to mention. For example, um, this is uh, what happens. Is it stable when flows arrive randomly and depart randomly? So that stability under flow arrivals and departures. What happens when, how do you give weighted bandwidth sharing to flows? Or how much, what are the buffer requirements for RCP? So we've thought about all those, but I won't be presenting it here today. So let me just quickly go through the implementation of RCP. So RCP is being, the router algorithm is being implemented on NetFPGA. So NetFPGA is a system built in Nick's group with, uh, and it's used for two main purposes. One is to help, it helps in teaching networking system design, and two, it, um, it's a platform for researchers in order to prototype their ideas in networking. So it's just a simple um, uh, a PCI board that, can pl uh, that plugs into any of the modern PCs. And it has four Ethernet interface cards, each running at one gigabit per second. And one of the things that was built upon it, for example, it's a fully functional IPv4 router. And RCP was implemented on top of this router. Now, there are two parts to the implementation of RCP algorithm. One is the, um, the algorithm that's executed periodically in order to update the rate R, and that is done in software. And two are the per packet computations that are done on every packet basis. Now, those are very simple. There are essentially only three things that one needs to do. This, just, this diagram out here shows the data path of an RCP packet. Essentially, one needs to find out whether the incoming packet is an RCP packet. Does it have a valid round trip time? If it has, add it to the running sum of the outgoing interface. And if the rate carried in the RCP packet is greater than the rate that can be offered by the router, overwrite it. So in the worst case, it's about two additions, a multiplication, and a comparison. The end host is being implemented in Linux, where for now we have the RCP congestion header as um, shim header between the IP and the transport. It's 12 bytes, which has fields for the, the RCP bottleneck rate information in the forward direction, the echo from the receiver to the sender in the reverse direction, and the sender's estimate of the round trip time. And in TCP, there is an RCP pluggable congestion control module, which just uses this information from the RCP header and modulates the sender's congestion window and paces packets as well. The other functionalities of TCP, such as its state machine and the loss detection mechanisms, remain unchanged. So our plans, now, our plans henceforth from over the next quarter or so is um, to demonstrate RCP on a test bed with multiple routers to demonstrate it under, more, under both different traffic conditions and different traffic patterns, both benign and under challenging traffic conditions. So uh, we're also currently working on an internet draft for RCP. That actually brings to the end of my talk. So to conclude, TCP is not suitable for a high bandwidth delay environment. It becomes inefficient. There have been many proposals, but by far XCP has been the boldest attempt, but it hasn't set out, but it hasn't achieved what it set out to do. As a result, there is no congestion control algorithm today that uh, can make flows finish fast in a high bandwidth network. Just making the network faster is not going to help if the flow completion time is limited by the number of round trip times that the congestion control protocols make the flows last. 
It's our premise that a good way to design congestion control is by closely emulating processor sharing. By that, the flow completion times are close to the minimum achievable. And RCP is a heuristic to achieve that. The consequences of that would be flows would finish much faster, several times faster than TCP and XCP. It's inherently fair among the flows. It's probably stable independent of the network and traffic conditions. It's easy to police flows, easy to give differential services, differential bandwidth sharing amongst flows. And it, as, you, as you've seen, it's easy to implement as well. At least the router implementation is not hard. So that's the end. You, so you mentioned that um, you know, RCP, particularly when flows are starting up, can oversubscribe the link. Right? Basically, just kick the router watch. Is this a, is a theoretical issue? Is it something that we'd actually be worried about? I mean, yeah. is the amount of synchronous, so, so if a whole bunch of flows all start at the same time, mm -hmm. it would be bad. I mean, is that kind of synchronization likely? Is I don't, so that is like the really worst case scenario for RCP, where a lot of high bandwidth flows just start in at once. Well, but even, even a lot of small flows would be problematic, right? Because they're well, all going to, First of all, it doesn't matter the number of flows. What really matters is the amount of aggregate traffic. So actually, I have a, a, a plot to quickly illustrate that. So this, number so this, pardon me? The number seems to matter. No, it doesn't matter. It's just the total. Uh, how does it matter if I have a 1,000 flows each having one packet to send? Because you give them a share saying everybody can send at rate R. So 1,000 new flows would be in 1,000 times All I'm saying is that what time. matters is the total amount of traffic uh, that the flows carry. If I have 1,000 flows having one packet to send, they might not really congest the router. Yeah. It's the aggregate amount Actually, of traffic. I think the side question is how do you define a flow? It's uh, just sender. Anything that reacts, basically my definition of a flow here is anything that um, whatever uh, the router is stamping in a rate r in every packet so whatever unit reacts to this rate r and and sends in packets at the rate r is a flow so it could so be a tcp level flow or so if, if there are if there are two tcp flows between between the same source and destination your router would consider them as one flow or two no i mean they are both they're all receiving a rate r so each one of them is going to pace its packets at rate R. So, so there are two flows. And your router doesn't? Well, if IPsec is used, you have to copy the congestion header from um, onto the uh, encapsulating header. And at the decapsulating point, you have to copy it back onto the inner header. So this is an example to answer uh, Dave's question, where actually, a, um, the network is the network utilization is high. It's at 100 percent, and suddenly, uh, a whole lot of flows start in at once. In fact, the network load just doubles within a round trip time. So as you can see, there is a spike in the queue. And <coughs> sorry, I should tell you what I've plotted out here. What's on the top plot is the link utilization versus time. What's plotted in the middle plot is the queue occupancy versus time. And what's plotted out here is the rate versus time. So the rate reduces in response to this. Q spike in the queue, but then it builds back. And this, and the, the time in which it builds back is actually in the order of about five round trip times in which it finds the new fair share rate. So RCP doesn't optimize the system for the case where there is a sudden influx of traffic, but it recovers from it quickly. Yes. I have to ask a question. How do you boost up the RCP? You mean, you mean it's for the rotors, it must be people, a people, people variable is the state of the R, right? Yeah. Yeah, so how do you, what's the initial value of this? Shape? It doesn't matter. You can just choose any initial any, value. Any? Yeah. It's but independent if you, for of. Example, if it's only port next, so if you choose the actual night, so everyone goes to flash and out of packet to, to the rotors. Right? It, sorry? What, what I mean, if, let's consider a simple case that is only one bottleneck. So the, if you choose any initial R, if it's too night, so everyone gets every source. Every, yeah, and R. then you settle down to your fair share rate. For example... So, um, I think you might, you're asking what do you put in the packet when it's launched from the source? No, 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 no. Uh, so, not the, the rotor. 
Oh, how to start? Uh, thing. For example, in this case, if you see, we just chose R0 as um, 1 over 20th of the link. But as you can see, it doesn't matter. In a few RTTs, it will find what the correct R is. And you're, you're referring to the time when, you, when, you, when so the so route of boots. Yeah. When it's yeah. So how to study, um, how could you handle the pattern so to not react to any pattern? There is no explicit reaction to packet loss because you are already getting um, you are getting explicit information from the router so on. If the ACK is not. If, if the. If the ACK is not. If the ACK is because it's stamped in every ACK packet and every data packet. So in the worst case, it's like all the data packets and all the ACK packets need to be lost for you not to have any feedback in the wrong trip time. And actually, if the uh, at the center side, the protocol is that if it doesn't get air feedback in the round trip time, it sends in probe packets, very small probe packets. So it's fine. Well, yeah. What happens in a world before all routers have the RCP stamping thing? And there are some routers that do it in some. Well, so long as the congested congested points have it, it okay. it makes sense. You mentioned that, if yeah. you, that I mean, there are there are a whole bunch of questions not addressed here, which are related to what, what does it mean to have incremental deployment? Right. What happens when we have a router that has TCP and RCP coexisting? What happens about you know the question about IPsec? What happens about multicast? We have blah blah blah. We can we can make a list of blah blah blah. And um, the uh, the I think in some ways the, the, the easiest way to think of this is that what does it mean for an end host to operate in an environment where some of the path has RCP? So you could imagine um, a sort of a deployment decision set that says, I will find an easy way where I probe in my SYN as to whether there's RCP, and if there's not, I just use, I use the instance. That'll probably be the easiest one. Um, in some cases, it's very obvious what the bottleneck is. The bottleneck is between my head end and me. And so it's really a question of figuring out whether there's RCP that my, uh, that my cable provider or DSL, DSL provider. And so it might be that in some cases, it's a fairly obvious choice that I need to make as to whether it's TCP or RCP. The, as soon as a, a router actually has RCP in it, if it wants to operate with both RCP and TCP, it would make most sense of having made the decision to put RCP to also have an RCP queue. So in other words, have a, a, a FIFO queue for everything that's not RCP and that for RCP probably would make more sense. Provides a little bit more of a, I, uh, I, I guess, not, not actually essential, but it will. I mean, I guess the concern was more actually the filler races at one point, which was, um, you know, what if I have RCP not on RCP at the router, not on the bottleneck link, but actually on a fairly fat link. And so now, if I have TCP and RCP flows going through, the RCP stamp says, "Hey, there's lots of bandwidth," but really, since the bottleneck is some other place, the RCP traffic going through those those links will absolutely crush the TCP traffic because it will back off. Right. So. So, no, so you're saying that there is RCP is not being used. Th there are two links, and RCP is not being no, used. No, so, so let's say I have, a, I have a serial chain of routers, and there's a non-RCP router, a, 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 a thin link, which is the true bottleneck link, then an RCP router, and a thick link. Okay. So if I have both TCP and RCP flows flowing through these two routers, RCP is going to be adapting itself for the capacity of the, the fat link and sending lots of traffic. But the, because the thin link is non-RCP? Right, because the, the router on the thin link isn't RCP, so it's not, it's, it's not properly stamping the RCP their capacity on the package. Yes, but that gets back to the, what Nick said, that you, um, you need a mechanism to probe okay. um, beforehand if the entire path can support RCP. Ah, uh, okay. And for example, uh, the, uh, the mechanism that's used um, in Sally Floyd's proposal for quick start is to have a quick start PTL and an IP PTL. And every router which understands quick start is supposed to decrement the quick start PTL. Okay, and so it's both match. Yeah. What if you just have the, the client sort of know picking up packet losses and switch back to TCP? Yeah. Right. You know, either RCP is failing 
or there's some bottleneck on the path that's not RCT. Yes, that's another path. way. So you can use an invariant property of the algorithm because um, if there are losses or there is excessive queuing delay, then RCT will reduce the rate. Uh, but if the client is not seeing anything like that, then it obviously means that the congested link cannot support RCP. Right, because I mean, yeah. you, you would like to be able to use RCP when not every hop does right. RCP, right. but the hops that don't are so, so over provisioned that it doesn't matter. I have a comment, which is about the interaction between RCP and TCP. If you're using RCP, you kind of assume that the sender is not going to react to packet loss because RCP is going to cause packet loss. Uh, during its convergence period. Mm -hmm. Whereas when you're falling back onto TCP, TCP senders actually use con packet loss as the only signal of congestion. So there seems to be like no good way of deciding when to shift from an RCP to TCP. I like what Nick was saying, which is like if the whole path was RCP, then you could just go ahead and use RCP no, and why make why isn't there any way? Because suppose I'm receiving, I'm an RCP source and I'm receiving continuous rate updates and I'm seeing packet loss. Now it is. You need to decide when you're going to let the RCPs. Suppose that the, the bottleneck, the, the route in front of the bottleneck is no, actually. When I say that it does not react to packet loss, what I mean to say is the source doesn't react to packet loss explicitly, but you can have a mechanism in which if I'm continuously receiving a rate R that's either increasing or about the same, but and I'm seeing bottleneck uh, and I'm seeing losses, then that means. You'll have to go, yeah, one, one level go, up. Yeah. yeah. Because RCP by um, the invariance of the RCP uh, algorithm is that as, long, as soon as there's a queue build up, it reduces the rate. You'd have to wait for, I mean, there are complications that can happen, right? You could, you could assume that the ACK is not coming back or the ACKs on the reverse path get lost. The ACKs that signal a decrease in rate. So it becomes a little tricky as to but what time scale. It doesn't matter. You, you really need a large, a very large number of ACKs or data packets to get lost in order for that, because the same rate is stamped in every packet. But if just one flow, you know, fluctuates the link, and the link is, you know, there's one more thing that the game will speed up and, uh, and put to other links related. So if one flow, the rate is out of control, it will make others affected. And uh, you may not receive an act, and you will speed up the flow that the rate can the congestion makes the whole network less. One flow is not, you mean there is one RCP? Well, there's no act for one flow. Okay. And uh, this flow will continue to set packet. And those packet will make others don't receive act. Well, okay, first of all, if there are no acts coming up, the RCP is, RCP also has a window size, right? So. If there are no acts coming up, it is not just going to continuously blast because there is, um, it does follow the window principles as well. Basically yeah. Basically just use it to set the window. So it is not that you just, if you're not receiving acts, you're continuously blasting into the network. You stop when. Okay, well, let's thank the speaker. And